All right, welcome back to Is There Life After Acts for Paul? And uh, today we're starting what's really a two-part message on what we've entitled The Fifth Missionary Journey of Paul. And it really takes us into uh, the AD 62 to 63 time frame. And this is really where we pick up, if you want to think about it, from the standpoint of after Acts 28, we get the, hey, uh, he's been here for two years. And, and this is after the two years now. Uh, so I guess we have to start, Gary, with, you know, we assume that Paul was released, and we've talked about that before, but in this chapter or this session, we really go through why we think he was released. So I guess, hey, tell us, tell us these assumptions that we think happened are some of these reasons that could have been that, that Paul got released after two years of being in house arrest in Rome. Sure. Um, first of all, uh, one of the thoughts uh, is that Paul's accusers would have had to make a trip from Jerusalem to Rome. And the accusers, if you look at the, uh, the hearings that already happened in Caesarea, included uh, and mainly were Jewish priests, and they would have had to make the trip there. And uh, they were very unlikely candidates to uh, want to go to a Gentile land. Uh, first of all, there were uh, kosher, well, we call them kosher, but it's uh, uh, Torah uh, contamination uh, laws about interacting with Gentiles. And uh, the priests would have there were rituals that they could go through to uh, be clean again and not be unclean uh, in that metaphorical uh, legal sense. But uh, they, uh, you know, probably weren't that thrilled to go that far. And then uh, they, they also probably figured since they didn't get a great hearing with Agrippa and Festus and Felix and everybody else that they'd been dealing with, why think you're going to have any better, uh, uh, you know, uh, judgment coming from the, the, the Caesar's court in, in Rome? And uh, third of all, there were uh, internal battles within uh, the Jewish uh, parties. And there were, um, I, I guess the best way to call them is uh, radical elements uh, like uh, the, the zealots and the Sicarii who, uh, actually uh, weren't above uh, slicing the throats of uh, priests who seem to be uh, collaborators with the Romans. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's some evidence of that uh, uh, it, even as early as 52 uh, AD uh, when uh, one of those priests uh, was, uh, was sent to Rome and he was acquitted by the Romans, but uh, when he got back later on in his life, uh, they said he was a Roman sympathizer, literally. So, you know, not not a, it was something that the, there was too many risks involved for them. And uh, that may be why uh, they just never showed up. And the case was uh, either uh, lost by default or just uh, dropped uh, for the time being. Because during our study of this, there, there was a couple of very, very interesting things that we pulled out. Uh, and, and uh, you know, the one is, hey, lease agreements for an apartment in Rome were normally two-year lease agreements. How about that? <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, all of a sudden, uh, you know, Luke just makes this offhand comment that, you know, he, he, he stayed in his own apartment for two years. Uh, so that, you know, we found that to be very interesting. And then there was another little bit, which is in Roman law. Now, it wasn't, if I understand this correctly, in mm -hmm. Roman law, if you're accused of something and your accusers don't make a presence in front of I guess, for lack of a better term, the court, uh, in two years, mm -hmm. they can't hold you anymore. 
so we got am i am i paraphrasing that correctly that, that's correct and what we found was uh, uh there's uh controversy about it because it wasn't actually on the law books that we know of until after Paul's time, uh, but uh, uh, as you point out uh, in our discussions, uh, it was probably an, uh, a custom or uh, an unwritten law uh, that, uh, yeah, if you aren't uh, uh, brought to trial within two years, well, the charges are dropped, and uh, it, it's a default, and you're, you're free to go. So, and and then so so you get this you know uh, sort of combination of in the Bible we get this two year period, and then we get lease agreements are two years in Rome, and the Roman law says if your accusers don't show up in two years you're free. So it's like, mm -hmm. how about you know you know the context there is is, is amazing. Uh, now mm -hmm. you you hit on it, but I'm sorry I'm going to hit on it harder. Uh, nope. <laughs> Uh, is it uh, uh, Ananias, the son of Nebadus? We'll take that. Okay, let's take that. Because that, that, so so this is the guy that's the high. Hey, listen, I tried. <laughs> this is the guy that's the high priest. He's the guy that's going to make the accusations, or he, you know, he would be the representation uh, to go to Rome. And this guy has already been arrested and taken to Rome. Because the Romans, the Romans in 52 AD, thought that he was a little bit too hard on his people. Okay, that's a little rough. Uh, you know, that's a little rough. So, so you get this idea that the the lead, you know, accuser, uh, the high priest at that time, has already been taken into Rome and brought up against charges and released. So he's sitting there going, "I'm not going back." <laughs> You know, I'm not going back. And honestly, if he sends somebody, he, they probably don't have a whole heck of a lot of credibility uh, with with the the governing body at that point. Um, but Absolutely. the the one thing that Scripture sort of leaves little breadcrumbs about is uh, Agrippa. Hey, before you, before you go away from that one, uh -huh. uh, one thing in uh, reading Josephus. Uh, Josephus ends up there in 63, uh, the next year, advocating for the release of some Jewish priests that had again been taken from Caesarea and Judea, from Judea and Caesarea and incarcerated or held in Rome for trial uh, because of the Roman governor. And the only way Josephus was able to uh, get their release was he met a, a Jewish actor uh, in the in Petuli in the in the port that he landed in, and that actor knew uh, Popea, who was uh, Nero's uh, girlfriend for a long time and then wife, and he got uh, entree to. Papea. He was able to meet Papea. We don't know that he got to meet Nero, uh, but uh, Papea lobbied with Nero to let these guys go. So mm -hmm. there was a uh, so that the only way that there was a positive uh, outcome to that particular uh, trip by Josephus, who who uh, was from Galilee anyway, and his family was probably from uh, the diaspora. Uh, so he already could be unclean in, a, in the sense that, you know, he's already uh, uh, having friends and family uh, uh, with those unclean Gentiles. So he was an acceptable uh, priestly family person to go. But uh, uh, he was able to do that only because he got an audience with the emperor's wife or the empress, as they called her. And uh, they uh, and she she lobbied with her husband to let let them all go. Uh, so we're not sure exactly what happened. That's what uh, we believe. Uh, we know that he met with her. We're not sure what the process was of letting them go. But uh, anyway, that that's the the general theory about it. And uh, so you had to have an in, or, or yeah. you probably weren't going to make that trip uh, ever again. <laughs> well, and and yeah. So I mean, you know, the all this stuff is sort of like lining up, and and that's what I think that's what we found out throughout this whole study is that 
you know, things line up with the scripture that are happening outside the scripture. And this, you know, what I'm going to talk about, or at least ask you about here is sort of what we've seen in the scripture, which was when, when uh, Paul was in Jerusalem and then had to go to Caesarea, you know, the centurion had to say, hey, you know, write a letter basically saying, hey, this is, <laughs> this is what this guy did is accused of, and I'm sending him to you. Well, Agrippa and, and Festus, uh, you you think are going to have to do the same thing because they talk about, hey, I got to hear what he has to say so I can, you know, tell somebody about it. And so they had to probably send a report. Hopefully it survived the, the, the great Malta experience. Uh, but they had to send a report to Rome uh, basically saying, you know, this is what this guy, who he is, this is the charges. And we found out that they, I mean, uh, Festus is like, if, if he wouldn't have gone to Caesar, if he wouldn't have said, I want to go to Caesar, we'd have set him free. So what do you think there? I mean, what kind of report would they have sent uh, to Rome? It, it starts with Lysias, who was not just any centurion. You're right. He was the Tribune, who's he's over all the other centurions uh, in the, in that uh, region, and he uh, writes a letter that we have in the Book of Acts yep. uh, related to us, which is kind of cool. Uh, that uh, says, uh, "Hey, there's nothing wrong in Roman law going on here. Uh, and haven't found him guilty of anything, but boy, what a ruckus it has caused! And uh, you know, I I send him to you, uh, and." Uh, you know, the governor, this is his boss, basically, is the governor. And at the time, that was uh, uh, Felix to start with. And Felix says, okay. In fact, Felix says, I'm not going to do anything about this until Lysias, the tribune, uh, comes back from Jerusalem to Caesarea, where that was kind of really functional headquarters was Caesarea. Jerusalem, they went to just when it was festival time and when there were big crowds there. Uh, or there was ceremonial type things to go to, but otherwise they stayed out of Jerusalem and stayed in uh, Caesarea. Well, at the beach resort. You know? Yeah. Well, I was I was going to say uh, the but Romans. Anyways, so that's the start of it. That letter yeah. starts it. Then he. Well, I was yeah, I go, was going to I was going to joke a little bit that the Romans only came into Jerusalem when the Jews were uh, basically celebrating their you know their escape and exile from a foreign ruler. Uh, you know, it's, we, that's, that's probably the time you want to have yeah. a, a, a good presence. <laughs> yeah, that's right. When you're the foreign ruler who's uh, now uh, holding on. <laughs> so, uh, so then, you know, it, it goes to Fe uh, Felix and he interviews him and uh, doesn't find anything wrong with him. Gives, in fact, after a while, uh, the, some of those initial interviews grants uh, that loose house arrest uh, where he has freedom. Uh, it tells us in the Book of Acts, and he has uh, uh, the ability to have friends uh, help him out. So uh, you know, it, it was uh, they, they realized they didn't have some criminal on their hands. He wasn't a revolutionary or anything. And uh, then Festus comes along and uh, invites a group and his wife to uh, to talk to him. All of them uh, say, you know, if we'd let him go, but he said he wanted to go see Caesar uh, rather than face the music in the Jewish courts. So we've got to continue holding him and send him on to Rome. And and I'm sure all of that inf information followed one way or another uh, yeah. to uh, to Rome. And, and that's why they, again, gave him a house arrest. He wasn't under you know, he wasn't like a revolutionary uh, in the dungeon or anything at that point. So uh, he's uh, he has that freedom and he has the friends again and uh, has two years in, in the capital of the empire. But uh, all to say, uh, a good word put in for him. Uh, so when he gets to uh, the court, uh, uh, one of the points uh, you may want to say more about too, but the... Uh, person who was in charge of the courts at the time was uh, Sextus Aphonius Burrus. He, that was Burrus and Seneca were the two uh, mentors uh, of the teenage and then into 
to his uh, adulthood and emperorship of Nero. And uh, Burrus was put in charge of the court system because Nero had uh, kind of checked out of that, said uh, uh, I, his, his predecessors had gotten pretty involved in when they appealed to Caesar that they were going to be the person that they appealed to. So like Claudius, for instance, the emperor, he was, uh, he was there and he was engaged with it. Nero took no interest at, in it at first and, and said, uh, somebody else that knows what they're doing <laughs> needs to be doing it. And, uh, or, you know, he might have just been saying, I, no, I don't want to get, get in the weeds. And uh, so uh, he, he had Burris take that uh, assignment. And, uh, and that, that pro because Burris was uh, more of a, uh, what would we say, an ethical person? Uh, and, you know, had, uh, had Roman law uh, pretty well down and, and was following it, uh, could, Paul had a fair hearing. So well, all think, that input we're talking about yeah. made a difference. Well, I think Burris is an interesting character from the standpoint of, you know, everything that you laid out. But I think one of the things that we've seen throughout Paul is he has a pretty good um, rapport, I guess is a, is a good way for it, with these military types, okay? Uh, and you have to think, he's been there for two years with a guard switching every four, four hours, and uh, you know that these guards have seen Paul, they've had to report back, that report's actually gonna end up to, to, to Burris, and now, you know, Burris is going to look on him, really, uh, I would, you know, we're taking, taking a guess, but it's by what we see in the scripture. Uh, he's going to look very favorable on Paul because Paul has been uh, very favorable, very, I mean, you could say it, very caring uh, about these guards and, and these military guys. And I think it all goes back to his tent making, to be honest with you, is that's his customer base. Uh, and so he knows how to deal with them. He knows how to talk with them. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, he's got that, that personal relationship with these guys. So yeah, Burris is going to hear the case. He's going to look at the evidence. He's going to see, you know, again, we're making the assumption that no one from Jerusalem bothered to even show up. And it's just like, mm -hmm. see ya, you know? Uh, and, and, uh, and then, you know, Paul's gone, you know, Paul, Paul's free. And, and, and we don't get just the fact that we get all of this wonderful things from the, the Roman culture that line up the two years of, of, it, of the, the rental agreement, the two years of being, uh, you know, basically held. And once that's up, you know, the Roman law says you're free. But then we get early church tradition and we get the letters themselves. Um, you know, early church tradition, uh, you know, tells us that, hey, Paul, Paul was released from his first imprisonment. Um, and Paul's letters, especially to the Philippians and to the, uh, the uh, Colossians and, and also uh, with uh, Philemon, he expected uh, to be released. Philemon. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He, he re expected to be released. And now you get to, hey, listen, we get we we pull up Titus in First Timothy and he's on a mission. You know, he he's on a mission again. And and so scriptural evidence really tells us, hey, he was released and and he had he expected to be released. You know, the details around it, you know, we can speculate at based off the culture, but he was released. So now you get the fun Absolutely. part. You get really the fun part. Uh, you you guys will see if you have the outline, and then we'll also show it on the screen. Hopefully, uh, Figure Eleven. Uh, at least it's Figure Eleven right now. Uh, it is you know this possible scenario of Paul going to Spain, and that's his ultimate goal. But if you look at what the Scripture alludes to. He goes east, back across where he's been before he goes west, and let's let's uh, you know the map is it will be up here and you can see it on your your screen hopefully. But 
talk about this. Why do we think he went east before he went west? Well, first of all, um, you got to think about how long he's been in house arrest. Uh, he has uh, been uh, in Jerusalem and then Caesarea for a couple of years, uh, maybe up to two and a half. And then he's off to the, the shipwreck uh, and uh, wintering on Malta, another you know, uh, portion of a year, um, maybe a third to a half a year. And then he's uh, in Rome for another couple of years. And so we're talking five years, at least a half a decade, where he's been uh, not out of contact because with that house arrest and with uh, letters and friends, you can stay uh, in touch that way, but he's had to stay in those places, in those cities, and uh, could not uh, be there personally, which, as we pointed out, he's, he was a frequent flyer. I mean, he had thousands of miles uh, on the ships uh, with, uh, you know, the wind blowing into the sails and uh, getting all over the place. And he walked all over the place, too. There's uh, thousands of miles of, uh, you know, just plain hiking down the Roman roads and, and uh, heading into places. So uh, for me, uh, this for, and for somebody who was in the travel business of tent making, uh, that was uh, one of the main customers were people who were traveling, uh, having their own place to stay. Uh, it was uh, the kind of thing where he was as a family business and as a, a lifestyle, he was on you know, wanted to be out there. And so, uh, and but when you're a prisoner, one of the main things when you're out of incarceration or being held in custody, whether it's house arrest or what, is you want to see your people. You want to see the people that matter to you. And uh, this, these, his churches are his family uh, and family in Christ. He calls them uh, brothers and sisters. He, he uh, has a, some of them are his sons in Christ, uh, and uh, he knows that there's things going on. And after five years, I know after five years of being away anywhere and you go back, things have changed. And so my, uh, my sense of Paul is he wanted to be on top of things and kind of refresh and uh, kind of restart reconnect the old relationships, find out who these new people are, because those churches have been uh, growing and uh, getting people as part of them. And so uh, that, that's a biggie, I think. Well, I mean, uh, Paul, you got to think in, in his mind, he is getting ready uh, to go to the unknown. All right. Uh, if he's getting ready to go to Spain, and like you say, he knew what was going on in those churches because he was getting people coming to Rome and telling him, obviously we, we see a couple of funny things in these, in these epistles where it's like, you, you got a couple of old ladies yelling at each other in the kitchen and Paul's having to say, Hey, you know, <laughs> writing a letter, <laughs> sending it back uh, several hundred miles or thousand miles, uh, trying to get that, that church fight to, you know, calm down a little. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, I mean, honestly, some of the things that he's dealing with is, uh, is you know, going into the kitchen during cooking the books, you know, uh, and making sure everything's all right. I love you ladies, uh, uh, you know. Oh, yeah, hey, awesome. you know. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, he wants to go and make sure that everything is good, that, that he's got no, all those, those relationships are in good shape. He's got people that he's going to put at places that he's mentored, that he trusts, so that, that that burden, I think, is sort of lifted off of him so he can move off to the West. Because um, like you say, when he was under house arrest, most of his house arrest was fairly comfortable, but you're still not free. You're still not free. Exactly. Um, exactly. And, and you have to th think about his age, too. Uh, Paul's now 60, uh, approximately. And uh, I'm sure he's thinking about it. I'm not, he knows he's not going to live forever, and, at, at least on this side of things. And so he uh, knows he's got to 
start to transition leadership to his other uh, leaders that are rising up and that have followed him and been uh, fantastically loyal, but they're going to need to be the guys, uh, these younger bucks like Timothy and Titus, uh, uh, et cetera. So uh, that's what's kind of on the horizon here is uh, as they make this trip and we go through the, the uh, tour, he's going to be dropping people places uh, for their leadership skills and uh, then pulling them and, and taking them other places. And I think so. Yeah, and a, I think it's a transition. Yeah, and we saw that during uh, during his uh, previous um, missionary journeys, where you know the first and the second were very different in flavor than when we get to the third, and how his leadership and his mental mentoring status uh, or style, I guess, in his leadership style is changing. And it, mm-hmm. you know, one of the simplest things that I don't think we even put into context when we're reading the scriptures, he needed money. I mean, uh, this this is a this is a missionary that's getting ready to go to a far off field and basically has been in house arrest for, you know, four or five years. He he's gotta fill up the coffers. And what does any good missionary before they launch do? They they go and visit their sponsored churches. I mean, uh, you, you have to. I mean, that that that, that model of missionary uh, resourcing is still the model two thousand years later. Uh, and uh, missionaries uh, uh, work with their connections. It's sort of before GoFundMe. Uh, missionaries have been doing GoFundMe for two thousand years. Uh, saying, hey, I'm headed to this land or I'm headed to this unreached people group and uh, will you be a sponsor for me? And uh, that's what Paul was doing. Paul set that uh, standard uh, in these areas and uh, isn't ashamed to talk about it in the letters and uh, for to talk about it with the people he's uh, visiting to, to say, hey, a uh, send me off, uh, you know, in a way that uh, we can uh, accomplish God's work together. So, and that's why part of the letters again was to uh, kind of report in. Yep. And and, and you're, I mean, you're 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 dead on bullseye right. This is this is the pattern that missionaries use today. Now, uh, again, there's missionary, uh, you know, what would you call it? You know, councils or, or groups. You know, right. But it's they the sp- same thing. Sponsor them, and they they make connections for them in the countries. But they still have those people. Uh, very often, raise their funds uh, as as well as they provide some basic training and and uh, possibly some funds. But a lot of it's your own uh, initiative and the Holy Spirit uh, convicting people to say yes. Uh, yep. We want to be in that part of the world. So, Amen to that. So, I mean, so we get all of this setting up, you know, uh, Paul gets released. Um, he has his eye on his mission, which is to, to go to Spain, to go to the West. Before he's going to go there, he's got to check out all of his churches, make sure everything's good. All these issues that were, were written about in the epistles are good. The people, the relationships are good. His, his leadership is, is good. Uh, and he gets to fundraise, I mean, uh, so that he can go to Spain. So um, that really moves us into what is going to be an overview of the travel law. So we're going to, we're going to try to be, because this is two parts, uh, the next session really goes into detail about where, you know, where he's going, what the story is for each one of these places, how it makes sense and all of that. But what we wanted to leave you with today is, okay, let's get a lay of the land. Let's look at the geography. Let's look at uh, the possible route and uh, just get that in your head so you chew on it tonight so that when we come back to the, in the second